let's get going. <clears throat> Today, we are looking at something a bit different. We're looking at Ephesians. <clears throat> it's an interesting case, a curious case, because uh, the Ephesian church first mentioned, uh, or rather established in Acts chapter 19, and it's a place where Paul spent several years laboring with the people and growing them and establishing a, a beautiful church. Uh, don't turn to Acts chapter 19, we're going to get there. We're going to the book of Ephesians, um, <clears throat> and then he writes this letter to them, uh, and, you know, unlike perhaps Corinthians and Romans, um, the theme of Ephesians is, is a bit different. It's curious. It's, it speaks about um, us being members of the same body, and it, and it speaks about salvation in, in terms we don't read about, for example, in Romans and, and before. And then many years later, John, in his, in, his, in his old age, writes to this church. Uh, in fact, God speaks to them directly through the words of John. Uh, this was a church that when Paul set out uh, to Rome, the elders of this church met with him and they cried. They were so sorrowful that this faithful brother in Christ um, they would never see again. Such love. <clears throat> A church established in, uh, in Ephesians, one of the uh, ancient wonders of the world resided in Ephesians, it, it, Ephesus. It was the temple of Dionysus. It was a, a, a huge, magnificent structure dedicated to the worship of Dionysus, which was done through sex. Temple prostitutes, people would go and worship this pagan god by doing all these um, unspeakable things in the flesh. <laughs> So it was, it was a place where they had to contend for their faith. They had to stand for what they believed. Yet, at the very end, Paul writes to them, one of the most famous uh, passages we have come to know in Scripture. And he says, you have done all these things, yet you have forsaken your first love. He writes that about the Ephesian church. Something that, as churches, we know, Lord, we will never be guilty of that. We will never fall into that trap. Anything else, he wrote to six other churches, but we remember that because it's, it's such a grave condemnation. It hits us deep in the heart. Ephesians is also the book where we find other extremely well-known um, passages that we can recall even without having read our Bibles in 10 years. The armor of God, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And then the armor of God, that's found in Ephesians. We are members of the same um, uh, body, uh, and the illustration, uh, the famous illustration of the church, Christ is our head, and we as, as organs working in, in unity towards the same goal, that's found in Ephesians. So clearly, Ephesians has something to teach us. And what we find are some very curious lessons. I want us to learn from these lessons. I want us to learn about what it means to function 
as a church with these lessons in mind. This was a letter for the church, for the people that meet together on a Sunday morning and worship and praise and take communion like we just did. Chapter 1 to chapter 3 talks about blessing. And not just a definition of blessing, but almost the theology of blessing, the doctrine of blessing. What does that word encompass? And what does it mean? And why is it important? if we are to understand how to function as a church. I want us to look at that together now. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to read Ephesians 1 to 6. Our message is actually from 1 to 16. That's a, a misprint on my part, uh, or, or rather um, a typo. It's 1 to 16, but we're going to read 1 to 6. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give truth and guidance to the church of Ephesus and that through the preservation of your word and the guiding of your spirit, we can learn and apply this truth to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Got it open here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, um, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons to himself through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, which he graciously bestowed on us in the beloved. Firstly, let us understand the source of blessing. We read here, it says, Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So we're not talking about our um, daily bread. We're not talking about friends and family. We're not talking about uh, the blessing that children are, the blessing of comfort and safety. We are talking about um, a different type of blessing. It says a spiritual blessing that is in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Whether it's the, the seat of God's glory uh, and his holiness and it, uh, it emanates and originates from that or whether it's um, our... Uh, communion and um, relationship that we will enjoy in eternity to come that begins now. <clears throat> the fact is that um, the blessing that Paul is uh, bringing to our minds uh, is something that we can't touch or see or experience with our senses. It's something that is realized, that is true, whether um, we, we interact with it or not. A great example is 
Imagine the Queen of England, okay? She's the queen when she sits on her throne uh, and wears her crown. But she's also the Queen of England when she goes and visits, I don't know, um, a family friend in Korea. <laughs> her, her physical location doesn't change um, the fact of her status. And so we are here on earth, but the blessing that Paul is talking about is, is fact, it's realized, it's true, and it's not on earth. It's in the heavenly places. Perhaps you can already uh, figure out where I'm going from, uh, from that. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So now we're looking at the scope of this blessing. In other words, what it touches, um, the extent of this blessing. <laughs> it talks about election and predestination. It's not something that was in the moment decision, a spur of the moment thing. It might have been for you when you heard the gospel, not knowing God before that moment and, and realizing your sin and placing faith in him. Uh, and that experience might have just been a moment in time. But for God, who chose us before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. How do we become holy and blameless? Through our salvation. The Lord ascribes those traits to us because through Christ our sins have been forgiven. But let's, let's not carry with that word all the connotations you might find and the incessant debate about uh, what comes first, the chicken or the egg. What Paul is saying is that salvation begins with God, that we have done nothing in and of ourselves to have persuaded him to have uh, moved him in any direction that he had not established in his infinite, uh, unknowable wisdom. That you and I this morning, through faith in Christ, have received salvation at one point in time. That God that God chose. We can't get around that fact, and it's a wonderful fact to embrace. But don't carry with that fact, oh, uh, grace is only for the elect. No, uh, salvation and grace is offered to the world freely, and that God desires that all men come to salvation. It's not an exclusive uh, uh, thing. It just means... That salvation begins with God. That's what it means. So the scope of that is that before the foundation of the world, God said, I'm going to offer salvation to you and to you. And I know that you will accept. We cannot reconcile uh, true free will. We do have true free will. I, I don't think um, there is such a thing as irresistible grace or limited atonement or any of that. But I do believe that God to be completely sovereign in all things. And for us to uh, reconcile that is, is futile. 
that God in his sovereignty is so sovereign that we have complete free will to choose him. And yet, he is still completely in control. Don't leave with more than what this verse is saying. Election has to do with the person. Predestination has to do with the purpose. When he predestines something, it's to put it on a, a track or a path or... Um, or to set a goal in front. It says he predestined us to adoption as sons to himself through Jesus Christ, according to the good will of his pleasure and to the praise of the glory of his grace. So the scope is from before the creation of the world We have been called not only to salvation, but, uh, but adoption as sons to himself. That this, um, this wonderful truth is, uh, is rolled up uh, with the fact that not only do we have our sins forgiven, but we are brought back into union and fellowship with our God. And it says, to the praise of his glory, to his good pleasure, for his will, and his grace that he bestowed it. So we have the source, we have the scope. Do you realize that your salvation is much greater than just the moment that you place faith in Christ? Do you realize that that moment stretches all the way back to eternity? And because of that moment, we will live eternally in fellowship with our God. It's not just a moment in time. We, we have a tradition in our family, and it's a wonderful tradition, I think. Uh, we celebrate our rebirth day when we place faith in Christ because we want to acknowledge what a blessing it is but it's not just a moment for God it it stretches eternally in either direction do you realize that the scope of our blessing that is salvation thirdly he talks about the substance of this blessing of salvation, he says, what goes into it? He says from verse 7, in him also we have received an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So this inheritance um, in the all uh, infinite wisdom of God that we who were f the first to hope in Christ should live for the praise of his glory. Should live for the praise of his glory. In him we have received an inheritance. It goes on and it says again, in him. Um, we were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So firstly, in him we have an inheritance. And in him we were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. We call that eternal security. <laughs> that your salvation is not a fickle thing. That you did nothing to receive it. And yet we think... Uh, wrongly that we can do something to um, disqualify us. That your salvation is much greater than anything that you or I can do. That the grace that um, goes into forgiveness of our sins is all-encompassing. 
it says, um, in him, it says, uh, after hearing the word of the truth, the gospel of salvation, and believing in him, were sealed to the promise of the Holy Spirit. Through this gospel message, a moment in time that all your sins have been forgiven from the day you were born to the day you will die. It says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. To be redeemed, the definition and the definition that the Bible uses is to um, pay for someone's freedom or to pay off the debt that someone else has incurred. And then Um, sorry, I just actually skipped over a bit. Um, we looked at in him we have an inheritance. In him we are sealed. Um, and then uh, actually in verse 7, in him we have redemption. Through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. So the redemption is that our sins have been forgiven. Uh, that's where it starts. Uh, but not only our sins have been forgiven, we have also become inheritors of this grace. And not only that, we have been sealed to eternity. It says it's through his blood and the forgiveness of sins, according to the richness of his grace, which he lavished on us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. And then Paul uh, writes, um, the source of the blessing, the scope of the blessing, the substance of the blessing, and then he writes <coughs> that um, that you may know the blessing. And it doesn't have an S in it, but that's fine. Know the blessing, to know it. He says, therefore, because of all these things, if you're following along in your Bible, therefore, I also, hearing of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and hearing of the love you have towards each other, he says, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention uh, of you in my prayers. But he tells them specifically, this is what I pray for. When I make mention of you in my prayers, this is my prayer to you. He says, so that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That your eyes may, um, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know. That this morning, do we realize, do we, do we even know? <laughs> the incredible, unspeakable extent of our salvation in Jesus Christ. That, you're, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints. Do you hear the words that Paul is using? Riches of his glory, the glory of his inheritance. It says, 
uh, it goes on, what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, what is the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. Our salvation is not something we receive and then put in a cupboard until the day that we die. Our salvation is actualized and realized every single day we wake up and we say, Lord, thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon me in your graciousness, in your love towards me to offer me salvation. May I never take it for granted. May I always be reminded of the greatness of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. May it be like riches to me. May I desire to know that in my life more than I desire anything of earthly value. It says, and when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, remember the source of blessing, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. And he made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. The Lord in which we have salvation is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. The Lord that uh, through his sacrifice we have salvation is placed above all the principalities and the powers and everything is subject to him. In him we have our salvation. Shouldn't that fact change the way we see things? Especially when it comes to our church. The Lord that offers us the salvation, which is uh, the riches of his glory, um, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and all things are placed uh, under his uh, uh, subjection, all principalities and power. That Lord is the head of the church. Now Paul has exhaustively defined the scope and the source and the substance of our blessing, and he has prayed that we may see it and receive it. See it. I should have said see it. May know the blessing. He says, the same Lord and the same salvation is why we are here. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. <clears throat> this is the introduction to a book about the curious case of the Ephesians. How to do church, how to do unity, how to do fellowship, how to do relationship, how to do love. Let's remind each other of the greatness of our salvation and that in light of everything else, this wonderful blessing. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I don't know the gospel. I don't know why Christ died for me on the cross. I don't know about the resurrection. 
I just come to church. I thought this was the right thing to do. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, in his love, willingly died for your sins on the cross as an atonement sacrifice. In other words, in your place to pay for our sins. And he did so because he rose again and conquered the penalty of sin, which is death. And he offers us this salvation if we place our faith in him, repent of our sins, accept him as our Lord and Savior. That is the gospel. If you have questions about that, come and see me afterwards. Know the extent of what it means to be saved. And know what it means then to be part of a church. We'll look at that in, in the next few weeks. And our AGM is coming up. And it's spiritual things. We're going to look at finances, and we're going to look at other things, and building admin. It's not just that. <laughs> Let's put things into perspective. And may the blessing of your salvation be known to you. Let's pray. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you. Show us day by day the scope of our salvation. Let us never forget what an incredible blessing it is, an act of your grace and your will and your good pleasure that you love us. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand uh, for our final hymn. Thank you. <clears throat>